All right, gang, um, we have our video here for the last section, section four of chapter 13. And we've been going through meiosis, and now we are going to look at some of the strengths of meiosis, um, uh, genetic variation. If we compare it to mitosis, if we were to make a new generation of organisms through mitosis, um, they would be clones of the parents, and there's no genetic variation, which can cause some problems. But um, anyway, fortunately, we do meiosis followed by uh, fertilization or sexual reproduction, and uh, so we get some variation. So we're going to go through three different ways that variation shows up. Um, Pretty straightforward. I'm just, again, copying the diagrams from the book, like always. And um, if you read this, it's just going to be stuff that was in the reading. But sometimes it's better to hear it than to read it. So um, anyway, first thing is independent assortment. And what's talking about independent assortment here? Um, we are looking at, so independent assortment, we're looking at the uh, homologs as they line up in metaphase. So uh, this would be meiosis 1, metaphase of meiosis 1. The homologs are lined up. And the independent assortment idea is that if I'm looking at the chromosomes and we have these colored differently, um, for this individual, you got half of your chromosomes from your mom and half from your dad. So this is saying the red ones are maternal, the chromosomes from the mom of this individual, and the blue ones are paternal, the ones from the dad. And oftentimes if you guys were drawing these, you would oftentimes just put the red ones on one side and the blue on the other side because it just makes sense to group them according to color. Um, but it doesn't, they're not actually colored inside of their, your cells. They, they look all the same. Um, and there's no like grouping according to all of dad's genes on one side and mom's genes on the other. I reverse that. But um, in reality, it's completely random, um, which one lines up on the left and which one lines up on the right. And these chromosomes behave independent of these chromosomes. So the way they assort during meiosis is um, independently. So that would mean that for these two chromosomes, they could line up this way with the paternal on one side and maternal on the other, or they could line up this way um, where we've got uh, a mixture. So we got big from big chromosome from dad and a small one from mom and big from anyway. If we kind of push forward with this, um, go through meiosis one. When meiosis one is done, that rhymed. Um, here we've got the beginnings of our haploid cells that look different, and we've got different types of chromosomes there. If I, uh, if I go all the way and finish out meiosis here, um, anyway, you can see that we've got different types of gametes being made. We've got this with paternal chromosomes, these with just maternal, these have the big paternal and the small maternal, and, and so on. So we've got these different combinations. In class today, somebody asked, this is a great question. In class today, somebody asked, um, they said, what does it matter? Because if they're homologous chromosomes, aren't they the same anyway? And I was like, oh, that's such a great question because it's such a common misconception. Um, and the common misconception is that if they're homologs, they must carry the same genes. Um, so here's the deal with homologs. Um, they are called homologs because excuse me, they look the same. So this one looks the same as this one. They're homologs. Um, and they have the same types of genes, meaning maybe this one has the genes for, um, I don't know, I have a lump on my nose. If I, if I go sideways here, there's just a little bit of a bump on my nose. Um, so we'll just say this is for the bump on the nose. That comes through my mom's side of the family. Uh, bump, not bump bump on the nose. Uh, <coughs> excuse me, my dad's family does not have the bump on the nose. So <laughs> we're going to say no bump, excuse me. All right. Um, and so that's for the bump on the nose. And, and they're homologous because um, they're carrying the nose bump gene, but they can have different types of that gene. And that's the big thing. So they're not exactly the same. So when I get down here, this one has no bump in its genes. This one has the bump. Okay. Um, if we look at the other chromosome, let's just say um, that this has to do with whether or not you have hair on this knuckle, your pointer finger. That's my pointer finger. There we go. Um, if you have hair on that knuckle, that's actually a genetic trait. It's really weird, but that's a genetic trait. I don't have hair on that knuckle, if you wondered. Um, but anyway, uh, so let's just say that this one is no hair, and this one is hair on that knuckle of your pointer finger. Right now, hopefully all of you are looking at your pointer finger to not... Uh, just to see. Anyway, um, go check with your parents. See if you have the same as them, and you can try to figure some stuff out here. But um, So, again, if we're looking at combinations, we've got no bump with no hair here. We have bump with hair here. But then I get over here, and this is what's exciting. Um, we've got no bump mixed with uh, hair. There we are, no bump mixed with hair. And over here we have bump 
mixed with no hair. It's a new combination just because of this uh, independent assortment. So um, that's the idea of independent assortment. We put some numbers to this, okay? And, and the book went through this, and if you grasped the numbers, it was pretty exciting. Pretty exciting stuff. Uh, but the numbers on this, if you want to statistically figure out, like in that situation, there was four possible gametes that could come. The, statistically, the way you figure this out is um, if you looked at each homolog, there was two different ways that the homolog could line up. Okay? Um, anytime that you're doing a series of events that have two different options, your statistical uh, formula here is two, two options and two to the nth, where n is how many different, um, in this case, homologs it is, but how many different events. So in the case of the cell we were just looking at, it was two to the second, because there was two pairs of homologs in there that gave us our four options. If we throw that into humans, humans, again, two options for each pair of homologs, we've got 23 pairs of homologs, okay? So that means we've got two to the 23rd, which the book rounds this to 8 million, but it's actually 8,388,608. What that means is for you, if you're a guy, that means you could make 8,388,608 um, different types of sperm just based on the, the idea of the chromosomes lining up independently of each other. If you're a female, you could make that many different types of eggs, okay? That's a lot of differences there, all right? Um, now, if we throw in random fertilization, what random fertilization means is that you, um, there's no rhyme or reason as to which sperm ends up fertilizing the egg or which egg gets released to get fertilized. Um, that's the random fertilization. So if we take two random chance events and see what the chances of them both happening, okay? So the chances of the sperm that made you was a one out of 8,308,608, okay? One out of that. The chances of you being the egg that got fertilized is one out of this many, okay? If I want to figure out what the chances of this and this happening again being, I take this and multiply it twice. So I, I square this basically, okay? That times itself. And that hits us up at our, our 70.3 trillion, actually it rounds up to 70.4 trillion different possibilities of egg and sperm. Um, so there you have it. You are a 1 in 70 trillion shot of your the sperm and the egg that made you coming together. The book says you're pretty unique. I say, wow, yeah, you're pretty special. Don't you feel special? Um, so now we're going to go on. Uh, this is before we look at some other type. This is, this is basic. We're going to add some more variation to it, and you'll find out that 1 in 70 trillion, you're way more unique than that. 